Welcome to One Broken Mom, a podcast dedicated to raising awareness of mental health, parenting, and self-improvement. I am the host, Ami Quiricone. One Broken Mom is not a family show. It is meant for adults and contains sometimes adult language. The topics I cover can be serious and unsettling to people. However, I do have a sense of humor laced with a little bit of a punk rock attitude. So if you're interested in real talks about real stuff by real people so that we can all get better together, well, then you're in the right place. And so welcome. Okay, everybody. Again, I have one of my favorite all-time guests on the show. It's Jax Anderson. Um, Jax, as you guys recall, that you are frequent listeners to the show. She's actually based out of Wisconsin, and she is a therapist that actually specializes in working with teenagers. And I love having her on the show. I say this every single time. Um, Not only are our conversations pretty direct and honest and and transparent, but her insight has been, I, I would say, in the last, you know, over a year since I've been actually doing this. And as a parent with teenagers, I got to tell you, her insight has been so critical for me in helping have a better understanding of my own kids and my relationship with my kids and really kind of getting them in a way that I know that I needed to. So I'm grateful to have her know her and share her with everybody else. Um, I feel like it validates me getting free therapy by bringing her on the show. (laughs) (laughs) And then, hey, as long as I give it away to everybody else, we're all good, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a nice exchange. It's yeah. okay. All right. Well, I actually, um, you know, there's an organization out there called the Child Mind Institute, and uh, they have a lot of really good research, and, and they also do provide therapy services. Um, they're based out of New York, and every year they do some reports on what is the state of mental health for children, and they actually did do a report on the mental health uh, state for teenagers and anxiety, and uh, that is one of the things. I, I share a little bit about what my kids are experiencing, but I don't overshare on One Broken Mom only because out of um, interest in their own privacy, and also, as I found out, the kids are actually listening to the show, even though this is an adult show, so I, this show today, um, w- when we talk about this, I want to be mindful of the fact that there may be some teenagers actually listening to the show, even though they're not supposed to. Uh, but, and we want to, we want to tackle this topic. Now, when I reached out to the Child Mind Institute and was like, hey, I would love to talk to you guys about this report, they were quick to say no. <laughs> and as we joked about, they're a big organization, they got a PR firm, and not everybody thinks that podcast interviews are helpful. Um, but I know better because I do get emails from a lot of people that are listening. And I know, Jax, you get people that reach out to you. And so we know that this is an important topic to talk about, not just because I do have um, teenagers in different forms dealing with different varieties of, of anxiousness and anxiety and depression at times. And that's something I have shared. Um, but what I always find interesting and, and why I like to talk about this is that there are adults that listen to this show who tend to identify with these topics that you and I have when we're talking about teenagers. Mm-hmm. They start to go, gosh, that's the way I was. And when we can talk about what's going on in the moment in the present mind of a teenager and, and the relationship with parents, it can help some of us you know, going back and, you know, trying to reflect on our own childhood to go, okay, now that makes sense of what I'm seeing coming out in my behavior today as an adult, also as a parent sometimes, and where that may be stemming from and what interventions may or may not have taken place when it was um, the right moment at the right time. So Mm -hmm. um, this is that twofold path, you know, of we'll talk about some parenting things today, but hopefully for the listeners that don't have teenagers anymore, you might actually be able to hear something in here about like, okay, my experience was similar or yeah, that makes sense. And, and understand a little bit more about what you want to work on today as you're going through Mm -hmm. your healing process. So, um, I have some statistics that I do want to read about this because anxiety is something that is pretty important for understanding um, with teenagers and with kids. And while I shuffled my papers around before the interview, I now completely lost myself. So give me a second here. Sorry. Um, But I'm going to read this. This is from the 2018 uh, Children's Mental Health Report. Copy of this will be in the podcast notes so anybody else can link this and and download it. Um, But anxiety is a normal response, it's a healthy uh, response to any threat in our environments. But anxiety disorders start to arise when we start to have anxious reactions that are out of proportion to things. Um, And and then they get kind of out of hand and they spiral. And so, what the Child Mind Institute's uh, Children's Mental Health Report looks at is just how widespread uh, child and adolescent anxiety disorders are and how they develop. And so Jackson and I are going to talk about that um, on the show today. 
In the past 10 years, there has been an increasing recognition of anxiety in young people by healthcare providers, including a 17% increase in anxiety disorder diagnosis. Yet anxiety disorders are described as the invisible condition, some air quotes there, with symptoms minimized or completely ignored, or as the great masquerader mistaken for other conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, bad behavior, acting out in class, just bad kids, and you know, more air quotes. Untreated anxiety disorders increase the risk for depression, school failure, substance abuse, and difficulty transitioning to adulthood. Um, the prevalence of it. At some point, anxiety affects 30% of children and adolescents, yet 80% of these kids will never get help. Um, anxiety disorders are mild for about 48%, moderate for 37%, and severe for 15% of those that are, are suffering from them. In college students seeking mental health services, anxiety is the most frequent concern. About 48% of them that are looking for some help or, help or wanting help with anxiety, followed by stress, which is 39%. And there's a lack of recognition. As little as 1% of youth with anxiety treat, seek treatment in the year their symptoms begin, and most anxiety symptoms go untreated for years. And anxiety is often mistaken for another disorder, resulting in ineffective treatment. When does anxiety start to develop? Um, they have started to see that at the age of two years old, uh, children begin to develop separation anxiety and start to develop some specific phobias. And social anxiety disorders start to develop at 14 years old, which is a lot of what I'll be sharing with um, the listeners today that we're dealing with in our household. 50% um, of teens either consider themselves shy or are described as shy by their parents, but only 12% of those shy adolescents actually meet um, the criteria for having a social anxiety disorder. Anxiety disorders are linked to a twofold increase in risk for substance abuse. And when adolescents have depression alongside with so social anxiety, it is strongly associated with more suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, and more depressive symptoms, which right there is a scary, scary, scary thought for any parent that's out there. Mm -hmm. What does social media have to do with anxiety? Higher emotional investment in social media was strongly correlated with higher levels of anxiety. And I know that from our household, um, social media can be used to egg on and kind of push buttons and increasing anxiety. Mm -hmm. And the treatment innovation, you know, innovations, what is it that you can do? Combined behavioral therapy and medication is effective in more than 80% of you struggling with social anxiety or generalized anxiety or panic disorders. And successful CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy treatment for anxiety disorders in youth, results in long-term recovery of 93% of the participants. So the value and understanding of like getting treatment soon and getting the right treatment, how important it is in, um, in being able to reduce. So anxiety, according to the Child Mind Institute, and I'm sure health professionals like Jacks agree, anxiety is the gateway disorder that leads to increased risks of depression, school failure, substance abuse, and suicide. And we've gotten very good at helping individual children and adolescents in need, but now we need to get better at identifying the vast majority that never get help and even know what to do or don't even know how to ask for it. And so that's why we're doing this show today. So thank you, Jax, for being on and talking about this with me. Of course. Thanks for having me. So grim statistics, those are awesome. Um, yeah. I know, <laughs> I know in our house, um, you know, with my daughter, um, and I, I make no, uh, no kind of claims of, you know, greatness just because I do the show, just because I am dedicating a minimum of one to two hours a week regarding mental health, parenting, and self-improvement through the show, through my own therapeutic process, does not mean I have solved all of our problems in our family. In fact, right. the only thing that I think that is a great benefit is having this high level of awareness so mm -hmm. that as my kids are going through these issues, I just know now more of what's going on than I would have known before. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that we have been dealing with in the course of the last few years is, um, is my own daughter's uh, struggle with social anxiety, friendships, school, things like that. My son has expressed anxiety in different ways. I see it in all the kids manifesting in different ways. So it's a very real part of the, of our lives in a, in a heightened level, probably at a, a, a more extreme than what most families deal with. Um, but I guess for anybody else, like I know what it looks like in my family. How mm -hmm. would you describe anxiety just in, you know, when it's not just normal versus something that parents should start to kind of look for in case yeah. they're kind of wondering, well, I wonder if my kid is experiencing this right now. I mean, what does that look like, Jax? I feel like when a parent is saying, I'm wondering if my kid is experiencing this right now, that's the time to call someone. 
<laughs> Fair enough, right? <laughs> I, tr- I trust parents' instincts. Parents know their kids, you know, inside and out. The kid knows moms inside and out. But, you know, but if you're, as a parent, starting to wonder if this is maybe an issue for your child, that's probably the time to call a professional. Mm-hmm. And the sooner the better, because unfortunately, te- you know, I mean, teenagers, they got to go through their developmental stage, right? But, uh, and part of that means they're not going to tell their parents everything. And, you know, teenagers you probably suffer, if you think your kid has anxiety, or you're wondering they have anxiety, it's probably more than you think at that time. So that's the time to call, is right. what I tell parents. So, you know, uh, we talk about the shyness um, because that is kind of confused, I think, for most people is that mm-hmm. if my kid is scared to go outside or scared to engage with other other kids at a younger age um, and uh, that that's viewed as a symptom of anxiety. But as the stats show, that's like that's not always the case. Some kids just can have a, a lower drive for social interactions than other kids mm-hmm. at extroversion, mm-hmm. introversion. Right. Mm-hmm. But anxiety, I know the way I have seen it isn't. Um, isn't always just this, um, you know, heart pumping, shaking hands or anything mm-hmm. like that. It's avoidance as, a, mm-hmm. as part of it. But, you know, with my son, what I saw his anxiety get expressed as um, his school, like mm-hmm. he just got overwhelmed at school and would fall behind. And mm-hmm. he wouldn't come out and say, like, I'm, I'm anxious, because he didn't know that that was a word to use to describe it. But when you started to talk to him, you'd sit there and go, okay, so your inattention in school and your, your l- lack of focus you know, sounds like that you're actually feeling anxious about school. And do you think that sometimes kids get labeled with something else like ADHD when it may be actually a form of anxiety? Yes, absolutely. The ADHD. And even there might be kids with, you know, as we grow up, we all have sensory processing things that go on in our brain because we all sense things. Some people's sensory processing is more um, significant than other people's. So a kid that doesn't want to go outside, you know, it could it might not be anxiety, it just might be a sensory processing issue. It's too bright. And just right now, brightness is affecting them differently than it's affecting other kids. Um, but it, certainly kids manifest anxiety in all kinds of different ways and they end up getting diagnosed with other things. But some kids get diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder when they're just anxious because teenagers will manifest anxiety in anger and opposition and defiance as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it just depends upon how they cope with stress. What have they learned? What have, what have they observed growing up and how to manage those intense emotions that come through? Mm-hmm. So they might get a diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder when that's not really what's going on. Interesting. Well, so for the listeners out there, you know, Jax and I actually had this scheduled, what was it, a week ago, I think, that we were supposed to do this interview. And yeah. um, when you schedule an interview to talk about teenage anxiety, um, don't be surprised when you have to cancel the interview because you get a call from the school and from your own yeah. child having <laughs> a panic attack um, yeah. and having some issues. And one of the things that when you talk about that oppositional defines, which is basically, you know, you're, you're being called out for being a butthole. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, was a, an incident at the school between my daughter and several friends. And all different forms of anxiety happened in this altercation between four or five 14 year olds. Sure. Uh, you have a young man who has got a lot of pressure at home to perform in sports, who then takes it out by causing fights between girls at school by setting up you know, fights. Mm -hmm. My daughter who wants to confront another young lady about her attitude and this young lady's response is, is defiance and anger and, Mm -hmm. and whatnot. And when I sat down with my daughter afterwards, I said, you know, um, she's probably scared, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, that that's another way that kids actually do, you know, be, you know, they look like they're being tough or they look like they're being strong, but really at the end of the day, they're, they're, they're protecting themselves. They're, they're fearful because like Mm -hmm. you said, something going on in them has taught them that you need to act tough when you're actually Mm -hmm. really scared shitless over whatever may be happening. Right. Or they just simply lack confrontational skills. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and so what happened there that day was um, uh, my daughter, while she puts on the tough face, is really kind of falling apart inside, wants to leave school, can't handle being there because the loss of the, of the social mm-hmm. structure around her and the relationships falling apart puts her into a tailspin. And mm-hmm. so we deal with that really um, pretty frequently. Um, so it can look like anger, 
right? Mm -hmm. It can look like um, shyness. No. Uh, it can look like attention deficit disorder. It can look like a, a lot of different things. Are there any other ways that anxiety can actually manifest that we'll sure. see expressed in a teenager? They can engage in perfectionism, uh, isolating. They can become, you know, the, the physically, physically upset. We talked about that a little bit, but headaches or stomach aches, in addition to like the heart beating faster, you know, uh, ticks can manifest as kind of ticks, picking, uh, pulling hair, biting nails, uh, any other kind of controlling behavior. Mm -hmm. Does self-harm ever find its way into this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what kind of risk factors are there for a child to develop anxiety? I mean, we talked about the, it can come in pretty early. Like, you know, does the teenager... Is it probably something that's been brewing in there for a while? Um, it can be. It, okay. It can be. I mean, you know, anxiety, uh, keep in mind that anxiety is like the Child Mind Institute started off saying, it's an emotion. It's a natural, normal emotion to have, and it serves us. So anxiety helps keep us safe. It helps us prepare and stay focused. So if I'm walking down the street at night and I know that there's a shortcut to my house down that alley and I've gone down that alley several times before, but this time I look down the alley and it just looks different. And maybe I see a shadow differently. Suddenly I get very anxious. Anxiety is telling me don't go down that alley tonight. So I don't go down the alley. Anxiety served me. It kept me safe. There was a guy maybe waiting to mug me in the alley. Um, so w when the Child Mind Institute was saying that anxiety starts to become dysfunctional when it becomes out of control. So that moment passing the alley doesn't end. Like now I'm anxious about what's around the next corner. And now I'm anxious about what's around the next corner. And what's that? Who's behind me? Who's, who's over me? And you can't even take another step forward because you're frozen in fear that something bad is going to happen. So Anxiety is kind of like on a, you know, like this scale, like from, you know, healthy, well-adjusted to out of control to some people don't have any anxiety, <laughs> which might not be safe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I've known some people like that. Like, do you have anxiety whatsoever about anything? Yeah. Um, right. So I, you know, risk factors for it getting out of tr control can be in nature. It can just be the physiological makeup of that person. You know, if there are a lot of sensory processing issues or maybe ADHD is there, mm -hmm. I know a lot of clients who have ADHD and they're anxious about it, you know, or they have some depression and they're anxious about their depression, you know, so um, the chemical makeup can cause it. But also as far as uh, outside risk factors in the environment would be um, this lack of really teaching kids what anxiety is or listening to their feelings and understanding that, you know, if your child complains of an upset stomach often, it might not just be an upset stomach. It might be anxiety. Mm -hmm. They, you know, start talking to them about how they feel like emotionally, not just physically what's going on with them at school. When my, when my daughter started school, I was amazed. I don't like to think of myself as a helicopter mom, but I often did because I was amazed at how many parents weren't aware of what's going on in, in school for their kid. And I knew, I found that out from a couple of her teachers were like, oh yeah, you're like the only mom that asks about that. And then of course, like, but I'm not a helicopter mom, am I? <laughs> like anxiety about that but yeah. it, I, I wasn't I was just really attentive and wanting to know what's going on so when she came home I could talk I could stay up to date and talk with her about friends in her class and what's happening what's the current trend in second grade I don't know but oftentimes kids will come home and they'll talk about things that happen at school or they'll be upset about things that happen at school and parents you know will mistakenly think it's a physical upset or you know, they don't want to go to bed or they don't want to do their homework or this or that before investigating, you know, what are you feeling emotionally? What's going on? Are you scared? Are you, are you nervous? Are you worried? Are you happy? Or, you know, it, whatever could be going on. So talking about it, I think 
is one of the biggest, not talking about it is one of the biggest risk factors or teaching about it. And in addition to that, if there's abuse, if there's neglect, Mm -hmm. uh, if there's uh, some the kids needs aren't met Mm -hmm. in any way, shape or form, anxiety certainly will manifest itself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, anxiety from a trauma can manifest in teenage years, you know, say trauma occurred when they were five years old and, you know, everybody thinks that they're fine, Mm -hmm. but then it comes back when they're 14 or 15 years old and whoa, and now they have all this anxiety over a trauma that occurred when they were five. And a trauma can be anywhere from like a bad car accident to my parents got divorced. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't have to be Trauma doesn't have to be bloody and gory. It can be, it's in the eye of the beholder. So it can be falling off a bike and just, you fell weird, but you didn't break any bones or anything. It just never got on a bike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Now, um, I want to, because there's a lot of uh, a lot of conversations and discussions, and it's going to be a topic that I'm going to actually end up pulling apart and discussing a little bit more on another episode. But this, uh, this, attachment theory. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been mentioned a few times through, you know, the course of the discussions, but really never fully, fully kind of explained here. But the the concept of, you know, our earliest attachments can also give us a sense of um, some people can be in, feel insecurely attached to their caregiver, and uh, some of them feel securely attached to their caregiver. And uh, the, those that have the insecure attachments actually one of them is called an anxious attachment where Mm -hmm. there's an uncertainty around you of whether or not someone's going to be available to you and to your emotional needs and to your, you know, even your, your material and your physical needs. And mm-hmm. that those are the kinds of attachments that actually start really, really, really early, you know, um, and, and, and that this insecure attachment very early on can mean that a child might be more prone to anxiety or anxious mm-hmm. behaviors. So you want to, do you feel like kind of expanding on that? Cause that was my untherapist description of it. Yeah. Well, anxious attachment is sort of like the, please don't leave me. I will do, I'll do whatever it takes to keep, keep you, you know, don't leave me. So it probably was, you know, their emotional needs were unmet in that uh, crucial time when they were younger by, you know, it, it, and it can be stuff that's, you know, even, um, unintentional, you know, mom has to hold down three jobs, you know, <laughs> and, you know, kid just, misses mom and feels like or dad and or care whoever the caregiver is and feels like they're not there they're not getting their needs met so this creates anxiety within the child because they're never seeing their caregiver but caregivers doing the best that they can mm-hmm. so it, it it's that it can also be abuse neglect witnessing parents fighting witnessing parents um getting hit uh, witnessing parents watching TV shows and movies that, you know, kids shouldn't be watching or doing that instead of engaging with the kid is very anxious, um, sort of art. I need you to be there when I need you to be there and you're not. So that creates anxiety. And then as far as growing up that anxiety, they'll try and attach to other people because we're social beings, right? Our brains are wired to be social with one another, but we have this fear then that people are just going to leave us. Mm -hmm. So with the anxious attachment, people become, people can become anxious avoidant too, where they'll like, you know, please, please, please love me, but don't get too close to me, Mm -hmm. you know, in in those moments, because I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to allow you to leave me because that creates anxiety for me. Mm-hmm. And then the anxious attachment is always just wanting everybody to like them. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say anything mean. You know, often hear teenagers say, well, I don't want to be mean. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I just, I don't want to say no, because that's mean. You know, it's very, very anxious about people not liking them, very anxious about people maybe rejecting them. Mm-hmm. And, and that causes a lot of fear. And that can come from feeling that way by parents and caregivers. Yeah, uh, it doesn't have to. It can come from a bad bullying experience in middle school too, and then it manifests itself. Right, right. I, I, I will share this because again, I think it. Um, just because I, I believe that it is important, and I believe that people do listen to the show because I am transparent about my experience, and if it resonates with somebody, then they learn from that or they get the sense that they're not alone. Mm-hmm. Um, what I see with my daughter and her social anxiety, that fear of losing her friendships, she invests heavily emotionally into her friendships. Then when they don't work out, it, it's traumatic for her. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so our experiences, as many people may know, is that there is a period of time in which her mother, that's me, 
was not there and available to her emotionally for almost seven years. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then she's in a household with um, her dad who was doing the best with what he had at that point in Mm -hmm. time. But for a period of time, she ended up in an experience around adults who scapegoated and blamed her for every problem there was as a young child. Okay. So, I mean, I'm going to try to say this delicately for the sake of education and not Mm -hmm. for finger pointing and getting pissed off at somebody, but, (laughs) but with that constant messaging and also the lack of, or feeling this lack of, you know, no safety resource because mom, I mean, I wasn't emotionally available to provide everything that I needed to do for her. Then she's now this young woman, this young girl, I'm still, she's not a woman yet. She's still a girl who is dealing with this when my network falls apart, it freaks me out badly. Mm-hmm. It, it terrorizes me. I have panic attacks. I, you know, because she's had all this instability around the people that were supposed to be the closest to her and the most deeply connected to her. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, I look at it with just this broken heart sometimes that the root of that social anxiety is coming from, from this attachment to people and having this feeling of this, of this insecurity with the, with the parents, you know, that were supposed to have been there for mm-hmm. her in a different way. And even though I show up, it doesn't mean, like I said, it's so deeply rooted. It took years for this, for this to develop in her and this, this anxiousness to develop in her. Mm-hmm. And it comes out for her many ways. It, it, she had a, she's had two panic attacks in this last week in the middle of the night where she's come into my room. Mm-hmm. And because she starts getting swirled up in her thoughts, it comes out with her being defiant in school or not mm-hmm. going to school. Um, and, uh, and so it, it, there's all these different, you know, elements and act, you know, like I said, we had to cancel an interview because I, mm-hmm. I had to show up and, and, and handle that part of it for her. Mm-hmm. But um, I, so I say this because I take some accountability for what parenting did and had to do in terms of an influencer in that. And I, mm-hmm. I hope that it, some parents that do have teenagers can actually maybe sit and, and think for a moment, is there something in my own actions and my behaviors, which is why I ask about risk factors, is that I feel like there, you know, this did go back years. It didn't just start the school year. The anxiety mm-hmm. wasn't just a thing that happened this year. It has been growing and evolving. And then you get to the teenage years, right? Where that adolescent brain development, you add in all the complexities of that on top of some weak foundations and stuff. And of course it can just go, you know, just kind of blow up. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I I think generally speaking, parents don't set out to fuck up their kids. (laughs) Right. 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 So I think that one of the most important things parents can do if they're relating to this is to offer themselves some grace and love and forgiveness. You know, it, kids are resilient. And if parents are able to allow themselves some grace and take accountability and have some self-awareness around this, that is the best thing that they can do to help their kid navigate and manage through the anxiety that they're feeling. You know, your daughter's got a better chance at 14 years old because you've made yourself aware of this and you're talking to her about this Mm -hmm. rather than, you know, defending against it or avoiding it because you're um, ashamed, which would be normal and natural to feel that way or embarrassed or maybe you're traumatized yourself. Mm -hmm. And so hiding from it and then her being, you know, 22 in college and then she's seeing a counselor there, she's going to, she's got the head start right now. So the sooner a parent is willing to open up that door, the better, Mm -hmm. but offering grace, you know, we're not here to hate on parents. We're not here to judge them or anything like, but this stuff needs to be talked about and it needs to be talked about in a way that really brings people's attention to it. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to say that I have had to learn to give myself some forgiveness myself because, you know, as, as I have been down this pathway now for some time, you know, I, I, it's not, it's not uh, hard to sit there and go back. Kai, if I had not left, like if, if I hadn't like fallen apart seven, eight years ago, what it's 2000, it's almost 10 years now. If that hadn't happened, my kids would be so much better. And then I have to remind myself, hold on a second. First of all, there's no guarantee that just because you didn't leave, everything would have been fine. Like that's not a guarantee. The reality is, is that you would have still been somebody dealing with their own, you know, conflicts with motherhood. You probably would have just dove into work even more than you did. 
dad mm-hmm. would have still been the man that he is, you know, yep. and the kids yep. would have just been different, not right. better, but different. So I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. so now if I look at it and go, well, then thank God, because I, I, I probably could say that I wouldn't have come to this whole awareness level of like, you know, curtains pulled back if I hadn't actually right. gone through all of that. And so that's the grace that I give myself is that again, mm-hmm. I'd like to think that I could have prevented all of that if I had just stayed. But the reality is, is that's, that was never the promise. You know, there was never a promise that they were going to have a perfect childhood and they were going to be emotionally well adjusted it, as long as, you know, I was pretending like everything was fine. So, yes. Exactly. Um, okay. So when we talk about uh, treatment and mm-hmm. for anxiety, and actually I'm going to, before I go into that, I do, uh, before we jump into that area, uh, you know, you have a Facebook group out there um, that's dedicated mm-hmm. to moms and daughters, which I love. And then I have seen some other Facebook groups out there and I've tried to, to go into them and I just, I can't mm-hmm. sit in them because I see a lot that are around teenagers and anxiety. And, um, and one of the things kind of circling back to this whole self-awareness for parents bit is I usually have to quit the groups because what I see are questions from parents with this whole the kid has got a defect and how do I fix my kid's defect? And a whole community of other parents chiming in with their advice that I just want to pull my hair out and go, oh my gosh. And I've seen it as little as like my five-year-old is super anxious and how do I get him to behave or stop doing it? And it, it's, it troubles me, Yeah, <laughs> you know, and it, and it actually makes me <laughs> I know, right? Okay. Anybody listening, if you want to see how we think about this, go to the YouTube version of this and you'll both yeah. be going, oh my God. But, um, you know, I don't know how to, maybe you can help out with how do you offer advice without to somebody who's where you see the anxiety is not just this little kid with his own, you know, natural tendencies. But, um, and I saw this really badly too, in, um, some of the, uh, you know, parents of gifted children, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, while I want my four-year-old to do my four-year-old's exceptional by the way, and I want my four-year-old to do this, but I can't get them to, you know, sit down and do their calculus homework. And now they're actually, they're acting out, you know, I mean, it's like, and I, I want to just say something and scream at the top of my lungs, which is why I just do my show. But, um, you know, if anybody sees yeah. something like that, do you have any, do you have any tips on that? Like, yeah. Um, well, you know, it's, it's tough because people are allowed to parent the way that they see fit. I always tell people like, there's many different ways to parent. There's not one way. That's why kids don't come with an instruction manual. As long as you're open to constructive criticism, you're open to educating yourself and other, you know, parenting techniques, instead of just getting stuck in your own and saying no before you even hear any other way, uh, then you, you probably are doing better than the people that just stay in their lane and don't visit any other uh, options. Mm -hmm. But what I tend to do in situations like that um, is I ask questions and I don't offer advice. I just, I ask questions to deepen the conversation. So, you know, with the five-year-old that's having anxiety, I might say, can you tell me more about the anxiety so that I'm able to understand what's going on? And generally in that case, then I'll get this like huge, (laughs) like, response of all the anxious things that the five-year-old might be doing. And then I respond with validation and empathy and compassion that, wow, that's got to be so frustrating as a parent. You know, I can understand why this might be, you know, um, hard for you. This is the first time you've seen this and it's hard to watch your child suffer. Uh, And then I would say, you know, something like, is there um, any, out of curiosity, Is there any anxiety that your child might be seeing in the family out, you know, that maybe they could be, you know, responding to? So it's basically a nice way of saying, well, are you fucking anxious? (laughs) Are you fighting all the time? Are you? Yeah. yeah. What's going on that your kid is seeing and responding? Because if they're five and they're acting out in that way, they're just acting, they're asking for connection. They want emotional connection, you know, now granted there's extenuating circumstances. There's, you know, there's autism, there's all kinds of stuff out there that could be causing this as well. But generally speaking, connection before correction is, you know, ought to be the primary focus and asking how to fix someone's anxiety will never, it, it, you can't it's two plus two doesn't equal four in that situation. And, you know, I've had parents come to me too. And, 
you know, they'll come see me without their teen and oh, I want to bring them so you can help fix their anxiety. And I stop them right there and I say, I'm not fixing your kid. If you're bringing your kid to me, I'm going to help your kid heal themselves. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to fix anything because I can't. If I had a magic wand, I would. Mm-hmm. I charge everybody like a dollar. I charge a million people a dollar and then I would retire. I have magic <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I remember one episode too that I did um, with about the narcissistic family dynamics mm-hmm. and um, Michelle Piper, who I was talking to in there, and I, I pulled a clip out of that one. You know, she defined anxiety as sometimes a sign of, of anger, you know, that can't be released. You know, mm-hmm. that for some of us, our anxiousness, you know, and our tenseness was because we, we couldn't fight back. We were frozen in, you know, a state. And then anxiety sometimes is, is also fear. You know, it's, it's, it is being afraid, being stuck in a situation or a captive in a situation that you're unable to get out of. And I know with my son, his sense of anxiety was rooted in the fact that if I say or do the wrong thing, there's a repercussion for this. And so I just am frozen, you know, and it, and, um, and so then it, it gets shown by, you know, and I, and when I came to that conclusion, I was watching him, we were packing, we had to, we had to move and we moved into the place that we're in now. And I was like, go take care of your room. And he, he stood there for the longest time. His room is a disaster. I mean, he's a teenage kid. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, he was immobilized and I just kind of looked at him and I was like, he doesn't know even know where to begin. And it's actually bothering him. I could see this on his face and his demeanor that he was struggling to find the starting point and was just frozen you know, and I was like, you know what, why don't you go do this thing? And I just grabbed garbage bags and just started throwing everything in there because I realized I could yell at him to get going, but that's not what I was seeing. I wasn't seeing a kid that was defying me. I saw a kid that was truly unable to decide to go A or B. And Mm -hmm. his experiences were that, you know, his choices and decisions had been challenged on a pretty regular basis. He'd want to make a choice, but then he'd be told no, and it had to do it a certain way. And when he's at an age where individuation is important to be told what to do rather than to be allowed, it it got him into, you know, that frozen and locked stage of, I don't even want to open my mouth because I, I'm just going to get yelled at. Like, I'm just going to be, you know, conflicted back in there. And that actually is a a way we see anxiety and why, right? That we'll see anxiety in, in teenagers of this fear of, if I do something, I'm the, I will be punished in some way or another for that. Does that sound about right? Yes. It's been instilled in them since they started school. They go to an institution where there are authority figures and the kids are told what to do. They're told when they can go to the bathroom. They're, they're told, you know, to be quiet. If they make noise, they're, they're always being told what to do. And the criticism is higher than the praise is. So they don't know how to problem solve themselves. They're not allowed to make mistakes. They're told what to do. So then when we tell them, you know, you make a choice or go do this, they don't know where to start because nobody's there to tell them what to do. And for over criticizing and judging and doing the Mr. and Mrs. Fix It thing more than we're praising or allowing them to make mistakes and suffer natural consequences or how are you going to fix this or how are you going to handle it or I believe in you that you can handle this. You know, they've been raised on this way of just doing what their parents and authority figures tell them to do and will love you. Just do what we tell you to do. And we will approve of you, you know, just do what we just be a good little boy or be a good little girl by just listening to us and doing what we say. Mm -hmm. And so they don't get enough praise. They don't get enough of us listening to them about what they think or what they feel. And, and that's just, that's just like then reinforced at school and at home. And then if they're in sports, you know, in, in, by their coaches and by other parents of team members, you know, it's kind of out of control these days, you know, you're seeing, do this, do that, do this, do that. And, you know, it's all in your head. Don't get upset. Just get out there and play the game. You know, so there's all this dismissiveness of the anxiety and, you know, if you just work harder, you'll be fine, you know? And, so that, that really, really reinforces a lot of anxiety. When they get to the teenagers, the brain is starting to change. That stuff just comes out and it just, you know, it just pours right out of them. And then they judge themselves. All those voices that they heard growing up mm-hmm. now are in their head telling them as they're going through this adolescent stage of development 
th those teachers, those parents, those coaches, authority figures are in their head. They're saying it to themselves, these kids, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I get it, like parents, you know, if we don't attend to our own stuff, we're going to put it on our kids. You know, I have anxiety. Mm -hmm. I've had anxiety my entire life. And my daughter, you know, she's eight years old. And I've, even though I'm a therapist, you know, she's, that doesn't mean I'm perfect at attending to her anxiety because when I'm anxious, it makes her anxious, which then sometimes makes me more anxious. And then I feel like a shitty mom and I'm anxious about that. And I feel like, you know, like it just, it's, you know, a spiral effect, you, you know, anybody out there who's a parent understands this. And so then when she's anxious, sometimes I'm not able to be there for her because I might be anxious or, you know, but I always try and make sure to come back later and have a conversation with her about it. And that's okay. Kids are resilient, but oftentimes parents that aren't aware that they have this anxiety or they aren't aware that, that this, this power or this lack of, um, you know, I don't know, uh, control exists within them. They'll get triggered. They don't like how it feels. And inevitably unconsciously they blame their kid for it. Mm -hmm. And so that message gets sent to the kid, which is only going to make them more anxious. Absolutely. And, yeah. yeah. And I know yeah. as a trauma person too, that is one of the things is that especially when your kids are triggered that mm -hmm. you, um, it's hard. You have to, you know, in fact, I just had this session with my therapist. I'm just like, you know, I, I can get still, I can mm -hmm. still feel the trapped feelings I had years ago when yeah. everything fell apart for me. Now it is talking myself back down. It's like, like I said, even though you know everything doesn't mean that you still don't have this internal work that you have to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you're right, you know, modeling um, mm -hmm. in front of them that, you know, it may not be that you're treating them anyway, but they're seeing everything still around you, you know, mm -hmm. still, and your underlying messaging that, you know, to be scared or fearful of things. Um, mm -hmm. I know that with my son, you know, there are rules. So we're not sitting here saying, let your kids do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. We all have to follow. There are yeses and nos. There are guidelines, you know, that we have to follow. But I think being mindful of the balance of saying like, listen, when you go into school, you do need to do these things, like, because mm -hmm. you have to graduate. Like, and there yeah. are things you have to do to follow to, to graduate, but then knowing right. that there has to be some level of autonomy in there and giving them the space to have the autonomy mm -hmm. and that there, and that the, um, the repercussions aren't going to be punishing. Cause for my son, while he wasn't the subject of a lot of the scapegoating, he certainly mm -hmm. saw it happening. So sure. his, so his adjustment in that situation was, is I'm just going to keep things to myself. Like, right. Good. Yeah. Happen. Right. And he wasn't always good, but he certainly didn't stand up. My daughter, you know, let's call it the DNA, but she's got a little bit of mom in her. So when it yeah. started to get to the place, it was like, you know, she, her anxiety is um, fear and anger held in. And then I think my, and my son is the same as well. You know, a lot of fear and a lot of, you know, a lot of um, fear and anger that gets held in and the way they express it is totally different. But you see that, you know, that the, that they have those, those experiences now. So then let's talk about treatment here. You know, um, you and I've talked about this before. It's my current conundrum, which is, and we actually had a full episode about this, about what to do when your kid doesn't want to go to therapy. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, we talked about like the Child Mind Institute, they show the effectiveness of CBT, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Talk about what CBT is and what is that, that process? Yeah, it's, it's talk therapy. It's cognitive, which is thoughts and behavior, which is behavior <laughs> actions. Um, but it's, it's, it's an interesting yeah. definition. <laughs> <laughs> our thoughts cause our behavior, right? Uh, so CBT therapy is just talk therapy. And there's some activities that you can get really creative with cognitive behavioral therapy, but it's problem specific and it's goal oriented. So you come in with the problem, we get into the thoughts. What are the unhealthy thinking patterns that is affecting the behavior in cognitive behavioral therapy? Having the self-awareness around that. Um, recognizing, you know, what are the distortions going on? Where is it happening? Where is the thinking um, distortion coming into play? And then using problem solving skills to, you know, re rephrasing some of the thinking, rewiring that brain and those thoughts, and then using problem solving skills that hopefully changes the behavior. So, and the behavior can be the reaction or the trigger to whatever co goes on that might be causing the anxiety. Like you see a girl, you know, like, um, this used to happen to me all the time in middle school. I'd be like walking down the hallway and then a group of girls and a clique, you know, would like look at me 
and then they look away and then they laugh. Okay. And like, you know, who isn't going to think, Oh my God, they're laughing at me. And it would just destroy me every time I would see that. Well yeah. then somebody had said to me once, like, well, what makes you think that they're laughing at you? How narcissistic of you. And I was just like, Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a different perspective. You know, it really shook up that thought that I was having brought awareness to it and helped me see it from a different angle, a different filter. And then it changed my behavior because when I would like pass those girls again and they would do that, I would come up with other things that they could be looking at or laughing at that didn't involve me and it would help me feel a little better. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's CBT. Okay. Now, is there anything, um, like I said, uh, getting a kid to go into therapy if they're having some high levels of anxiety, because again, the stats show it, if you get treatment done, yeah. you, you, this is recoverable. And for all the adults that still have anxiety, wouldn't it have been awesome? <laughs> you know, if when yeah. the brain was forming, we were able to get on top of this and get those, you know, weed out the bad and, and reinforce the good, you know, when it's actually all coming together really nicely. Right. But if, if, if kids aren't going, is, is, are there ways in which a parent, the self-aware parent, could actually yeah. implement some of these strategies into their conversations with their kids that would be helpful? So doing CBT with your kids? I, I guess. I mean, I wouldn't call yeah. it that because I don't want to start licensing people, but it, it, no. it sounds like the way you're describing it, that there may be some really good ways for somebody to sit there and, and yeah. integrate it, at least to start it, right? Before yeah. maybe getting them there. Yeah. Psychotherapists and psychology, they do a really good job of coming up with fancy words to describe things that, you know, anybody can really do. There is CBT for dummies. It's a book. It's a book. Buy it. <laughs> yeah, it's really cognitive behavioral therapy for dummies. I actually own it. It's actually really good. Um, there are resources that you can download, like my website, all those resources that are downloadable. It's all mm -hmm. CBT stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's made for parents to be able to talk to the kid. I have a whole thing on anxiety. It's like three different resources on anxiety itself to help parents talk to their kids, help them rephrase things, help them pay attention to what their thoughts are, help them pay attention to how their thoughts affect their behaviors, all of that stuff, how to rate their anxiety, how to understand what it is. And there's, I mean, you don't have to go to my website to get them. They're everywhere. You can find books like that. Just Google, you know, how using cognitive behavioral therapy as a parent. Mm -hmm. you know, or uh, thought distortions, you know, helping my teen with thought distortions, helping my teen with self-awareness or anxiety as an emotion. You know, you could Google it and you'd probably come up with a ton of results. Now, the trick is though that do you want to be your kid's therapist? Do you want to, you know, do you want to do that? So incorporating some of it into the conversation is great, but the best thing a parent can do when it comes to this, I even tell parents, you know, when they ask about my resources, like, listen, my resource is designed for the parent to learn and then encourage the teen to learn along with them. And the parent do this too, modeling it, mm -hmm. you know, cause your teen, your teen's not going to go to therapy. If they don't want to go to therapy, they're not going to go if you're not going. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sign up to go to therapy yourself or find out why your teen doesn't want to go to therapy. Is there a reason they don't want to go to therapy? Did they have a bad experience? Did they, did they hear about a bad experience? There are lots of different counselors out there. Uh, they don't have to go to somebody that's just going to take notes and ask them how they feel about everything. There's, you know, the, you interview different people. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think finding out what their hesitation is would be a parent's, would be a good first step. And then being willing to, you know, do your own work. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as everybody knows, I, we do, I do my own work. Um, mm -hmm. I know that with, um, with my daughter, uh, she has a, a, I would call it a love hate relationship with it. And the last time we went as a family, and, and that's where her, her uh, additional anxiety is, is that mm -hmm. therapy can be hard, it can be painful. Mm -hmm. And we did have a session with the three of us that left her particularly vulnerable and, and w wounded, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. wounded in the sense that we didn't go into Nobody went in to get hurt by it, but it was such a, a powerful, you know, emotional experience that she's just not apt to kind of go yeah. down that path again. Yeah. Um, not right now, but over the last week, she's finally, you know, come out and said, listen, I'm tired of feeling this way. Okay. So mm -hmm. let's bring this back up again. I guess mm -hmm. I asked about some of the strategies only because it feels like they're really good ways of changing our conversation with our teenagers mm -hmm. as well, that there's, mm -hmm. that they, it, it may in fact be a way in which we learn how we should be dialoguing 
with our teams, not just waiting until crisis happens, mm -hmm. but this understanding of teaching them how to be mindful of their own feelings and the way the body feels and, and, and dissecting those emotions because it helps with, you know, again, creating and teaching empathy. You know, even mm -hmm. if even if your kid is fine, it sounds like the kinds of conversations that would help them just be, you know, yes. better, cooler people, right? Yes. I think that just teaching better, cooler people, yes, of course. <laughs> I think teaching, teaching meditation and mindfulness and just talking about, you know, when your kid says they're feeling, you know, I don't know, I'm just feeling, I'm feeling weird today. Oh yeah, tell me what that feels like. Like, what do you mean weird? Like, how, how do you know you're feeling weird? Like identifying like what's going on in the body with the thoughts and, uh, you know, everything in regards to that progressive relaxation, you know, tensing your muscles and then relaxing them, tensing them and relaxing them. So you have control over your muscles, whether they tense and relax, and then you to understand what it feels like to relax them you got to tense them first to relax them it's like with the anxiety you know first we have to get anxious in order to manage the anxiety right mm -hmm. um, there's lots of different things that you can do role-playing I often teach parents how to use role play to do cognitive behavioral therapy so you know uh, if teenager is dealing with a bully you know maybe the teenager plays the bully and the parent plays their teenager and then they switch it up and they come up with uh, you know, what are some things that the bully usually says to you? Or what are some things that usually happen that cause anxiety? Well, these things, okay, well, let's set those up and let's do them in a safe place with a safe person and we'll switch role playing. So then when that moment comes next with that kid at school, you've already worked it out in your brain, you already have the neural connection, it's easier to respond in a healthy, well adjusted way than it would be to, you know, go the old way with getting anxious or however the response was in the past. Right, right. And you're able to uh, plant that seed in there so that when they have that anxiety kick in, they're not trying to manufacture something on the spot, which they're not capable right. of doing. You've already given them kind of like a crutch, you know, a good crutch to be able to lean into when they're in that moment. Right. And the thing about anxiety too is like anxiety often comes from the amygdala. And we've talked about this before. The amygdala is a part of the brain that's in charge of fight, flight, or freeze. Mm -hmm. And so the amygdala doesn't understand thoughts and words. We can't just talk to our amygdala and rationalize with it. The amygdala is constantly scanning our environment for threats. So if over time we have learned that counseling is a threat or being in groups of people is a threat, you know, because of a traumatic experience or a bad experience, then our amygdala, it's going to sound the alarm every time it feels something like that is coming. And then you know, for the next 90 seconds or so, our system goes into this fight, flight, or freeze. Mm -hmm. And what happens when the amygdala does sound the alarm is it disconnects our thinking brain from the reacting brain. And we go into full on reaction mode. So when somebody's in anxiety in the moment, it's very hard to process thoughts. Mm -hmm. So if you've already visualized it in role play, and you've already set it a million times in your head back and forth with your with your caregiver or your parents it's easier to respond in that moment when you're just hit the, when the amygdala sounds the alarm it's much easier to come out with a robotic response than it is to think because the amygdala has shut down that part of your brain pretty much right exactly well um i think understanding you know that uh to me like a key overriding message of today is that anxiety doesn't just look one way uh, you yeah. know, that it has a lot of different faces in our teenagers. And mm -hmm. sometimes our depressed teens, um, uh, you know, are, are dealing with a, this internal anxiety that they don't know how to overcome it. Our angry mm -hmm. teenagers may in fact be anxious. Our, um, you know, our introverted teenagers could be. And, and finding out and starting to want to, to get into their heads a little bit and help them through that. Yeah. And also, you know, like I said, I've, I've seen a lot of adults, you know, that I'm experiencing now. I mean, you admitting to, to having your own anxiety, but I've seen a lot of adults that still struggle with that today. And it's like, mm -hmm. and, you know, to me, my hopefulness is that if we can, can identify it sooner and know that there are interventions and things that we can do at an earlier age for them that um, we hopefully can spare them, you know, it being something that actually vastly alters our life and our future and our relationships and the quality of those relationships in our life, you know, moving forward and stuff. So, um, 
Okay. So when we're looking at CBT that, um, that the Child Mind Institute had said, and again, their fact was in their study was that a combination of cognitive behavioral therapy and antidepressant was effective in 81% mm-hmm. of the separation anxiety, generalized anxiety, and social anxiety disorder. Um, but one of their other notes that they found in their study was a long-term follow-up found sustained benefits from CBT treatments for eight to 13 years later. So that means now we're surpassing the teenage years and we're getting into the adult years. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, if you're an adult right now that has dealt with anxiety, this might still be a good option for you to consider. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, these treatments are effective. They're, they have lots of evidence and data behind them. CBT has been around a long time where we've been able to collect a lot of evidence that it works. And these are life skills that last forever. Mm-hmm. So even if you're an adult and you've never done therapy before and you have anxiety, you can um, resolve your anxiety to a large extent by starting cognitive behavioral therapy, some sort of talk therapy, you know, and, and working hard and committing to it can definitely resolve a lot of those issues. It's not hopeless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, I do know a handful of adults that have gone the medication route because Mm -hmm. they've gone into, and this isn't a statement of that being good or bad, but I do know a lot of adults that have gone medication only without Mm -hmm. therapy. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I've, I've met some adults that, you know, took the pills because a doctor, not, not usually a therapist or a psychiatrist has prescribed them, but their general physician has said, oh, well, if you've got anxiety, you know, take some, um, take some pills here. And they do that for a long time without the benefit of therapy. And then, um, you know, I can think of a couple of examples that once they started to go to therapy, this isn't the case for everybody. So I don't want anybody saying that you can just cure yourself of the need of medication because you go to therapy. But for some of them, once they started to go to therapy, and actually uncover some of the sources of anxiety and what was going on going through this, this talk therapy process, mm-hmm. actually found that the medication wasn't necessary. And right. I say that cautiously because I do know that some people do have some deep-seated work where medication is amazing yeah. and, mm-hmm. and should be done on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. But there is some opportunities, I always believe with you, that mm-hmm. therapy, a talk therapy should be involved as well, you know, mm-hmm. because there is a practice of rewiring and that, like you said, neuroplasticity of work mm-hmm. that's involved where you can make some, you can make real physical changes to the brain yes. within mm-hmm. limits. Some mm-hmm. of us are going to be the way we are, you know, for yeah. genetical, g- genetical reasons. That is not a word. I know that, but I might add it. I might word. add an urban dictionary, genetical reasons. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> It's my new word, <laughs> but for like genetics, it. yeah. Um, I think we should make a t-shirt. <laughs> we should. You can make up the word epigenetics. Somebody just invented that word. <laughs> right. We can do right. genetical. <laughs> yeah, we can do genetical. Um, but anyways, that for, you know, for a lot of other factors and we're all complex human beings and our solutions aren't always just, you know, one size fits all and stuff. Um, but as you said, you know, going in and being able to resolve anxiety later on in life, because I've seen some people, and I've said this before that, you know, growth doesn't happen because you've accepted who you are. It happens when you've decided who you are is unacceptable and and you're ready to, and you're ready to make changes and stuff. So. Right. Exactly. Cool. Okay. Well, Jax, again, I always love having you on the show. We're going to have you back on a handful more times. Um, <laughs> I, I keep saying that the summer is upon us now. I'd love to go to, I've actually got a, 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 you know, several listeners are actually in your area out in Wisconsin. I don't know if it's you driving around to different towns and downloading the episodes or not, but I thought how fun would it be to come out to Wisconsin and maybe do something with you to meet, you know, yes. some of the listeners that are in your area. I think that'd be kind of cool. So that would be fabulous. Yeah, we so we'll take like that live recording. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't think I haven't been thinking about that. So, and I, I thought about, you know, when I opened up my map for my podcast episodes and I could see where the listeners are, I thought, well, th- what a great way to just design vacations around going where people are. So, um, yeah, I think it'd be really cool, but you know, you do some great things. And so for anybody that's listening again, if you've got a daughter, Jax actually has a great Facebook group, which is about teen, you know, moms and teen daughters. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of other moms out there that are all bouncing questions off of each other. And Jax jumps in and offers, you know, some, some advice and stuff and kind of tips and coaching through people. If, um, you know, if it's necessary, people ask. So that link will be in the podcast notes as well, a, a link back to her website so that you can look at some of the resources that she does have available on 
online for you to be able to purchase. Um, very economical way of being able to put some things in practice. But I'm with her. We're in the same camp that, you know, parents, when you have some kids that are really expressing and, and going through some troubling things, just, you know, don't be mean to yourself. Don't, don't think that anybody's blaming you, but just, God, just be willing. I think if you're listening to the show, you're already showing a willingness to kind of be a little self-reflective and a little mindful of what you could be doing um, and what you could be doing to be helpful, not only for yourself, but also for your kids. So, you know, kind of take a look at whether or not family therapy can work out. And then I know I've talked with Jax about this before. She does offer some online coaching. So mm -hmm. if you are um, in need of, you know, not getting a good fit yet for your family with a therapist, you know, certainly hit her up and see if she can't help kind of coach you through um, until you do find maybe somebody in your local area that works out really well or maybe you know having her help you you know guide you on your parenting with your teenager might be a, yeah. a good long-term solution for you so cool well, thank, well, thank you. you for having me on. Uh, always. <laughs> Thanks for coming back on. And thank you for being considerate of the fact that we had to scrap this because social anxiety and everything reared its head and it became like a reality. You know, that is what life is. a great deal of respect for anxiety. <laughs> yeah, right. I understand. Right. Yeah, very good. Cool. Well, you have a great day. Thanks, you too.